This week, we welcome Jorge Salamero, the Director of Product Marketing at Sysdig, to talk about runtime protection for containers. In our second segment, we welcome back the legend himself, the man, the myth, the legend, John Strand, to talk about backdoors and breaches in incident response, response card game. In the security news, your smart Christmas lights are safer than they were last year. Intel's SGX coughs up crypto keys. When the sciences do certain things, hackers can block iPhones and iPads via uh, the airdrop attack or hack uh, iPhones and iPod or DOS, I should say. Uh, how hackers are breaking into ring cameras, which is really lame, actually. Uh, and Bloomberg accidentally created an Alexa flashlight. All that and more on this episode of Paul's Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly. For security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, and the cocktails flow steady. It's Paul's Security Weekly. NetSparker, the developers of desktop and cloud-based web application security scanners that enable you to automatically identify vulnerabilities in your web applications and web services. NetSparker scanners employ a unique and dead accurate vulnerability scanning engine that automatically verifies vulnerabilities with their proof of concept. For more information, visit them on the web at netsparker.com or email at contact at netsparker.com. The question is simple. Have any of the systems on my network been compromised? The answer is harder than it should be. Enter AI Hunter. Active Countermeasures has auto automated and streamlined techniques used by the best pen testers and threat hunters in the industry to create AI Hunter, a network threat hunting solution that does the first pass of a hunt for you to identify systems that are most likely to be compromised and scores the results on a scale from 0 to 100. You can then research those systems in depth with AI Hunter. Focus your valuable time on the systems that need your expertise with AI Hunter. Sign up for a personal demo today at securityweekly.com forward slash ACM. Are you an enterprise dissatisfied? with overpriced analytic software that can't keep up with modern data? If so, then GraphWell is the solution for you. GraphWell is an unstructured data analytics platform for enterprises who demand total data visibility across their network. GraphWell lets your security team go beyond the SIM and fuse data sources to correlate and answer questions you didn't know needed to be asked. Go to graphwell.io forward slash security weekly for an unlimited data trial and gain uncompromising visibility today. And welcome to the show. But first, let me introduce you to a man who often thinks you had me at Fleshlight, Mr. Paul Asadorian. Welcome to Paul Security Weekly. It's episode number 630, recorded on December 12th, 2019, right here in G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island. Uh, to my right, on a very different set tonight. Yeah, uh, this, is, this is weird. It's weird, I know. This is the set that we record Hack Naked News, Enterprise Security Weekly, and Business Security Weekly on but since we're prepping for the holiday uh party um we are recording on this set tonight as there's all kinds of stuff going on off camera over there so larry good to have you in the studio yeah it's gonna I, you, bear with me as i readjust this microphone because it was like in front of my face and uh, hey larry looks like a microphone this week so. yeah we're like all uh, kind of out of sorts yeah <laughs> this set it's really yeah. strange like like, <laughs> the, like i've noticed that uh, already that uh, and i've already picked up on it that i go to talk to you and yeah uh, like i know normal, uh, like no i have to like lean like yeah, this and yeah, turn, yeah. turn your yeah, chair I, a little I was bit doing the same thing yeah so when well, we got you a really nice microphone I now know. what is uh, it this is the, the these are high lpr 40s we've had one for a long time yeah. And um, Cyber Monday. Nice. It actually went on sale. Nice. And I'm like, guys, if that mic goes on sale, you have my authorization to buy the, it. And these are, these are like the, the Heil style microphones that we bought way back in the days. Uh, yes. Those are the high, the, those are the PR40s. Uh, this is the original Heil PR40 that, that I bought, bought way back in the, back day. In the day. Yeah. We had like, because all you could afford is one because they're like $400 each. But Black Friday brought that cost down to, I think we got $330, something like that. So okay. I was like, yeah, buy it. Yeah. My favorite microphone for podcasting. Yeah, it's nice. Uh, on the lines uh, remotely, Mr. Tyler Robinson is here with us. I think you're you're on the same, you look at the same set going on. You, you act surprised today. I am. <laughs> no, it, we, are, we are on the same set today. That's awesome. It's fantastic. And you sent a picture in the Slack channel last week, Tyler. I meant to tell you this. It was definitely <laughs> an RFID reader writer, I think, sitting on your desk. <laughs> <laughs> when you sent that picture, because I was like, "What is that?" App? I'm like, "Oh, that doesn't surprise me." There's a few of them sitting there. It's awesome, <laughs> Mr. Lee Neely, 
with his straight out of North Pole sweater on. What's going on, Lee? Not much. Just getting into the Christmas spirit. Got my uh, my crazy Christmas sweater, and it does say straight out of North Pole, but I can't quite get tall enough. Looking forward to a great evening. Yeah, but and, I we, and, we don't, turn these and we don't off. want to see the South Pole while you're down. Yeah, we don't so. see the North or the South Pole. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you can just keep that yeah, to yourself. Let's, let's keep the poles apart. <laughs> <laughs> don't cross the streams. That's it. Uh, quick announcement: Join us at Infosec World 2020, March 30th through April 1st uh, at the Disney Contemporary Resort. Security Weekly listeners get 15% off the Infosec World main conference or a world pass. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash ISW2020 and click the register button to register with our discount code. All kinds of great talks happening at InfoSec World and training, so make sure you check that out. Uh, They're adding new stuff all the time, and it is one of our favorite conferences uh, to attend. So for this uh, segment, we welcome Jorge. Oh, hey, Jeff. Jeff is here with us. Yay! Finally! Yes, nice to have you, Jeff. I've only been sitting here for a half an hour. Hopefully drinking and prepping for the show. You didn't miss much. A- just Absolutely drinking and prepping for the show, and I, I, it's obvious now that things are just a little bit out of sorts there. Yeah, dude, we're on a different set, and we're, we're going we're gonna to make it work. We're going to overcome our different environment. Uh, introducing uh, Jorge Salamero for this interview. Jorge enjoys hey playing with... Con- hey, Jorge, how are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you guys? Good. Now, Jorge has marketing in his title, but he is very mm-hmm. much a, a technical person. Uh, he does a lot of uh, research around containers in Kubernetes, home automation and DIY projects, uh, formerly a, a Debian developer. Um, and uh, here on the show tonight to talk about runtime protection for containers. Yeah, that's correct. So I've been spending... Uh, the last few years working on open source and as uh, containers and then later Kubernetes become like a de facto cloud operating system. I started like riding that wave and that's where I'm spending most of my time today. That's awesome. You know, we've, uh, a lot of us on the show, um, maybe either Ben pen testers or our pen testers today. And it's interesting if you, gained command uh, shell access or remote code execution, and you're inside of a container, there's different things you have to be aware of. And I think we'll talk about how to protect against some of those different things that that might happen from an attacker perspective. Mm -hmm, That's correct. This is actually one of the very interesting things with all these new infrastructure layers of containers and Kubernetes. So you have on one side what's happening on the host on the container, but you don't have a user interacting with the system anymore. You have a layer in between, which is Kubernetes. So you have your users interacting with Kubernetes, um, and then it's Kubernetes is telling the containers what the user dictated. So you need to be able to understand both sides of the equation. Like, what's the system doing? What's your orchestration doing? And we'll be talking about that. And now, Jorge, you can uh, have containers running without orchestration in Kubernetes being the <clears throat> shining example, kind of winning mm-hmm. the uh, orchestration kind of wars, if you could call it that, right? Yeah, um, yeah. And so, but the if you have an orchestrator, your orchestrator is providing that role-based access control for your containers to access resources, correct? That's correct. So when um, we started to use containers, um, the main benefit was I'm able to package my application with the libraries all together in basically like a Lego brick, like a unit that I could use any, everywhere the same way. So that was a great advantage. But actually, there was one further iteration, which was I'm going to standardize how I configure my containers how I deploy my containers, how I scale those containers up and down. And a bunch of different uh, container orchestration platforms that were available for some time, uh, Mesos and DCOS, uh, Marathon, Habitat, Docker Swarm, and Kubernetes is one that was started at Google, and then it was uh, made available as an open source project. 
And it seems that the entire community has been converging towards that orchestration tool. And I'm, I'm confident to say that nowadays that the de facto orchestration tool for containers. Sure. And I, I also think orchestrators played a role because very quickly when you start, if you take an app or you're going to build an app and you're going to build it using containers, right? Docker being the de facto standard there. What you quickly realize is that like your whole architecture changes. And mm -hmm. I, I didn't, it took me a long time to come around to this, right? Because I've been doing this a while. Many of us have, and we're like, oh, wait, our application is really comprised of multiple services. And then you're like, well, all these services should have their own container. And now containers need to share resources and containers need to be able to talk to each other. And now we have to orchestrate not just you know multiple instances of our application, but all of these containers together. And Docker Compose very quickly becomes somewhat limiting when you're, you start to mm -hmm. scale out your application, right? Did I yeah. capture that? Yeah, that's correct. That's a fair assessment. So. Um, imagine when we started to use containers, you could seal SSH into a host and do Docker run or even Docker Compose app, deploy your containers, have them up and running. But that was not enough. We wanted to have containers as a distributed system where we could spread those across multiple hosts. We could scale the, those up and down, move them into different nodes if one of those nodes was um taken down so suddenly there was this new layer sitting in between and the developers the devops teams they were not any longer SSH into the notes they were using uh tools to talk to the orchestration layer like qctl so i basically was saying i want you to deploy this container and i want three instances of it so this orchestration layer was taking care of doing that. And with this orchestration layer, now we have started to implement some prevention mechanisms to define what users can and cannot do, who can do what in your cluster. So and that's the beginning of the runtime journey that we will be speaking today. And I, I think from a security perspective, there's a lot of benefit to be gained here, right? Because when, when I think of the different services inside of your application, those may have lived before in a library that you import, mm -hmm. may have lived as a different function, but now you can say, mm -hmm. hey, this is a separate service, and oh, by the way, I'm gonna wrap that in a container, so all of the operating system libraries and everything to support this service is wrapped in this neat little container, and now I can be very granular about what resources can access that and what mm -hmm. resources are is that container able to access is it storage mm -hmm. is it network and all of you know is it the secrets manager right mm -hmm. and it, it yeah, i'm really coming around to uh really liking this new kind of wave of the way you're building designing and deploying applications today that, that's correct and this is similar to what was first like the chicken or the egg so what was first uh containers or microservices Runtime security has been a very complex challenge, uh, and it's not new uh, into the security uh, environment or to the security scene. So, uh, runtime security has existed like for forever, let's say that, but it was really hard to implement it. And now, when microservices, we have a specific, a single purpose. Uh, units of computing those each of these microservices that they are just doing one function. So it's very easy to say, all right, so this container is just going to run this single process. It's just going to have this one port listening. It's going to have this kind of connection, network connections, and it's going to have this kind of file system activity. Now we can use tools like Sysdic that they can uh, define uh, behavioral profiles or patterns to define what is like safe behavior. And if the container changes that, moves away from what's defined as the standard safe behavior, we can say, hey, there is something weird going on here. Mm. I'll let you have a look at it. And it, it's interesting, a lot of this functionality exists if you were deploying using Kubernetes, right? 
it mm-hmm. exists in the platform. I mean, you can run Kubernetes mm-hmm. yourself. You can go to a service and the major mm-hmm. or not major cloud providers, right, and get it provided to you as a service. And there's multiple levels within there. But mm-hmm. the, it, it, none of this is really new, right? We're just kind of laying the foundation for those that might be new to, to this technology. Um, but when you have this, there's a lot of complexity now that we're introducing mm-hmm. yeah, and configuring yeah. your own Kubernetes or even configuring it in, you know, uh, Amazon's cloud, for example, and the number of different ways they allow you to do that. Uh, I'm, I'm like, I, I need to go to like some training to understand yeah. how this all works. Yeah. Cause now all the terminology is different. Right. Yeah. And what, what SIS did, what the security providers like yourselves are providing is mm-hmm. a way to help manage that. Right. Because while complexity gives us a lot of controls, it also makes it easy for us to introduce mistakes. Yeah, exactly. Uh, new layers of infrastructure, increased complexity. So we need tools that actually help us to configure some of the security capabilities that they are already uh, existing in Kubernetes. Actually, when I'm trying to explain runtime security, I like to say that we can define like um, three or four steps inside runtime security. The first of all, it's enforcement or prevention. These are basically the permissions that we can configure on who can do what. Kubernetes has some functionality for this, like admission controllers, like Airbag like network policies, like pod security policy. That's called enforcement. Kubernetes provides functions for it. Then we have detection. Detection, I like to call it the last barrier of security. When we still deploy all these enforcement measures, but still a hacker can go through, the detection is the last barrier of security. We can catch that intrusion as it went through our security layers. And then we can do the blocking part, which I like to say it's like the third step on runtime security. If someone does, I don't know, imagine someone does common injection in our application. I can still go and kill that container, kill that process. The fourth step on runtime security is auditing and forensics. In the event of a catastrophe, I need to be able to tell the story. I need to be able to say, this is what happened, how the hacker did break in, what kind of like data expectation happened. Um, I need to be able to be prepared to respond and explain everything. So those are the four steps uh, that I typically use to explain runtime security. Um, uh, Jorge, I, I think one of the, the interesting yeah. aspects, just building on what you you, you just said, yeah. right, is when you're a developer, like like I am, uh-huh. I guess, I, now I'm, I'm trying to yeah, pass the torch to it. an actual developer, right, not a hacker trying to be <laughs> be a, an application <laughs> developer uh, with a, writing a production app, right? And so what I noticed is that I'm a developer, I'm learning all of this technology, right, to mm-hmm. understand, because this technology changes, right? Because I'd be having conversations with people and they're like, oh, Jenkins is like, that's like so two weeks ago, right? Mm-hmm. Like, two weeks, what are you talking about? I'm just trying to understand this. And so you, you're researching on the internet, you're trying to find the right way for your application to configure it. I found there's a lot of really bad advice in terms of security when it comes to how to configure containers and your orchestrator. Would you would you agree with that? Yeah. Well, as any new technology, different people have um, early opinions. So um, you need to be prepared to talk to people have to, who have been using containers for some time already. Mm. Uh, to give you an example. Uh, Sysdeg started as a container visibility project, open source project, in 2013. So wow. we were one of the first uh, projects into the market, first as a project, actually, and mm-hmm. then later as a company. And visibility was on the DNA of Sysdeg, like looking into what's happening inside the containers. I remember, actually, one of the early t-shirts that we had in the company that we have like an octopus coming out of a box saying, what's inside? Mm. And that actually, that very simple idea actually uh, summarizes 
the core technology of CSA, being able to tell you what's happening inside the containers. Some of the bad advice that I want to get your take on and, and why runtime protection is so important. Mm -hmm. One theme that I noticed is user permissions. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes when you're looking into building a Docker container, the documentation doesn't tell you to drop those user permissions down outside of mm -hmm. root, which you don't really see it running as root. You're just in your Docker file, it's running as root. Then you have to purposely drop those permissions down to a regular user so that your container's not running as root. Would suffice well, to say that's probably the, the, a good example of bad advice mm -hmm. when you read on the internet about mm -hmm. containers. That's, that's correct. And hear that. Like, we thought we were very advanced in terms of security when we went through the entire DevOps way with uh, config management tools like Puppet, Chef, mm -hmm. Ansible, then containers came. And suddenly, we started to run applications as root again. I don't care if they were running, say, a container. They were running as root. Mm -hmm. And then we started to use Kubernetes. And it was not until a long time ago that, by default, Kubernetes have permission uh, system turned off by default. And even nowadays, any user in Kubernetes can schedule a privileged pod and from that pod execute the shell, do container breakout and access to the host as a root user, which mm. is something crazy. Like this is happening today mm. with a default Kubernetes installation. So there is a lot of like bad advice, or I don't want to say bad, I want to say naive advice. Mm -hmm. You need, if you're running containers in production, you need a security tool, opinionated security tool that they can give you indications on what to do, how to configure your clusters, and how to configure your workloads. And, Does that and, also apply uh, for, uh, for logging? <clears throat> So the, oh, the consolidation totally. of all the logging and stuff? Totally, totally. Actually, this is actually one of the my favorite demos of what we did at Cystic, being able to show you what happened in your cluster. Do you guys want to see what kind of cool things we can do? Absolutely. All right. Mm -hmm. So let me let me share my screen here. And so this is uh, this is Cystic. And here we have what we call the event feed. The nice thing is, rather than looking at hosts and containers, I can look at my Kubernetes applications. So here I can see all the applications and all the different security events. And I can go into one application specifically and just look at the incidents happening in this application. So someone <laughs> run a shell in a container. The cool thing here is I can tell you exactly what happened in which Kubernetes application, with host, with container, etc. But one of the things that we have done at Cystic, and I'm, I'm actually very proud of this feature because we have been the first vendor into the market, being able to correlate system and container activity with orchestration activity. I was telling before, now with Kubernetes, you don't interact with the host, you don't SSH you talk to the Kubernetes orchestration. So we can see how someone did a cube CTL exec, and I can tell you which was the user, to which groups belong, from which IP address did that, and I can see how he ran a shell in this container. And I can drill down and correlate all the activity he did after uh, spawning that shell in the container. So he ran the bash, downloaded some kind of like funny thing from the internet, probably some malware, uncompressed it on the system, and deleted the bash history behind. So this is the, the kind of use cases you need to be able uh, to cover to respond as you roll out uh, Kubernetes in production. And that's, so that, I mean, that's super important because... <laughs> logs when you're working with containers get really weird, right? Mm -hmm. I'm like, what? Well, so what happened when I ran this container? And then you read it and you're like, oh, I have to go run Docker logs and then the name of the instance. And 
And then if your app has multiple containers, like consolidating all that down, having this tool is super helpful, Perfect. right? Yeah. So the, also, the, oh, go ahead. No, no, no. I was going to say, like, back in the day when we had a security incident in an EVM, even though we have logs, as a, as a SOC team, as an InfoSec team, response team, we SSH into the mm -hmm. machine and we were starting to do our forensics analysis there. Now with containers, you don't have that capability. Anything that hasn't been instrumented into blocks, as the container gets killed, it's going to disappear. And actually, on Sysdate, we provide a functionality that we allow you to reconstruct all the system activity, even if the container doesn't exist anymore. And this is, this is if you, if you guys uh, remember Wireshark, this is the same concept of Wireshark, but extended into the entire operating system. I won't record in a pickup file uh, only network, but the entire system. This is the kind of activities I'm going to see, even if the container doesn't exist anymore. Well, in, in a large orchestration too, you're also able to correlate and look at the heuristics of multiple events maybe occurring across different containers or different applications. So mm -hmm. if you're being targeted for an attack, the ability to correlate those logs and have that visibility with inside of those becomes very, very much more apparent from the orchestration piece. Mm -hmm. We saw the correlation capability before, like looking at the kubectl event versus the system activity. Here, what it's very cool is that I can reconstruct any process activity and look at the files that they were read or written by this <laughs> process. If, even if the container doesn't exist anymore, even if logs won't be enough, and I can see, oh, this is this VLANI backdoor. Let me actually reconstruct the contents of this backdoor.c file and see what kind of like malware was uh, this guy trying to install my system. So these capabilities become more important than ever when using containers. So Jorge, when you deploy a container and the container is running and it has a uh, syslog and like the Linux logging built into it, right? When you deploy a new container, if you're not doing something specific to save those logs, they go away. But mm -hmm. you can capture not just like the Docker logs result, but also any internal logs that are being generated by that container as well. Absolutely. Every system call, really. Yeah, like, gotcha. Yeah. With Wireshark, you record every <clears throat> single uh, packet, mm -hmm. network packet. With uh, says so like you record every single system call. Now, oh, go ahead, Lee. How hard? I was I was going to say how how hard is it to get that going? I was thinking about how much you're doing here and thinking of conversations I've had that basically on the other side ended up in well that's complicated and requires work and mm -hmm. therefore wasn't done. <laughs> this looks yeah. like it might be easy. Mm -hmm. So so. Recording everything all the time can be can be tricky, especially <coughs> because it has a performance impact. But typically, what we do is we only uh, trigger that capture when we detect a security incident, a policy violation. And actually, this is a need with containers. With containers, you cannot just wait and look at your CM see that there was a security incident, and do that security playbook by half. On containers, everything happens very fast. Actually, we did a okay. report where we saw that containers last typically less than five minutes. So <clears throat> attacks are typically automated to containers. So security <laughs> uh, response, threat blocking needs to be automated. So oh, yeah. Either you take a capture for forensics or you stop the attack, blocking the container or isolating the container. Those kind of actions need to happen automatically. Your security playbook needs to be automated with containers. So, Jorge, how is um, how's this deployed, right? Because we've, we've covered on the show uh, mm -hmm. quite a bit in the past. You know, Is it a privileged container? Is it a kernel mm -hmm. module? Is there 
uh, a library or, or a small, I hate to say agent because it's not really an agent, right? You're mm-hmm. hooking every mm-hmm. container with, with mm-hmm. something running or you, I'm assuming your customers, believe in our briefings we've done previously, that you have options and how this is deployed into your environment, right? And at Sysdate, we love you to, we love to give you options. So to start with, you have Falco, which is an open source project that is started at Sysdate. You can use that for free as a do-it-yourself, open source, community-run project. We also offer um, a commercial product uh, that's called Sysdict Secure that covers the entire um, Kubernetes uh, lifecycle, mm-hmm. image scanning, vulnerability management, runtime security, auditing, compliance, forensics. And you can use it SaaS from us or you can deploy it entirely on-prem on your system, even completely egg up. It's completely up to gotcha. you. Gotcha. And if, uh, how, what's your hook into uh, Kubernetes, right? So as, as Kubernetes uh-huh. are deploying, is there like something that's being built into every single one of my containers that gives Sysdict that visibility? Mm-hmm. The, the, the nice thing we do here is that we hook into the kernel, so we don't touch the containers. Mm-hmm. We actually believe uh, you shouldn't modify your running containers. That's dangerous. That can has performance impact. That mm-hmm. ha- can has security uh, risks. Uh, what we do is we talk to the kernel. Same way that Wireshark captures everything that goes through your network interface mm-hmm. with Sysdict, we hook into the kernel and we capture every system goal that goes through the kernel. In an asynchronous way, without modifying your containers, completely transparent instrumentation. And from there, we get visibility on everything that's happening, containers, the orchestration layer. So in my deployment model, Jorge, do I need access to the kernel? Or if I'm deploying somewhere on another hosting provider, do, are there other options for me? Yeah, so... I don't care if you're running OpenShift on-prem or your own Kubernetes, or you are using AWS EKS or mm-hmm. Google GE. All these platforms are uh, supported because all they include support to eBPF. eBPF is the framework we use to hook into the kernel. And actually, oh, I see. I was one of article. the systems yeah. we yeah, wrote a book on eBPF. Mm. This is actually the same subsystem that IP tables, now it's called NF tables, uh, is using nowadays. And uh, it's like um, Netflix uses it for performance analysis to make sure mm-hmm. they can stream content to all those users and, and adjust exactly. dynamically, right? Yeah. Exactly, exactly. It's the same framework. Gotcha. Because we have our monitoring tool as well. Not only is it secure, we also have Sysic Monitor. We use the same approach. Mm-hmm. Hook into the kernel to capture all the system calls and convert those into our performance metrics, let's say. That's awesome. The the other bad advice I see out there is in really bad examples and then bad advice on how to overcome them is the management of your secrets, right? Mm-hmm. And I, I look every application I think modern application today and even old legacy applications, right? They're going to have uh-huh. some type of secret, right? Whether that's the database username and password, whether that's an API key, well, uh-huh. it, it, you know, the, the list can go on. Um, yeah. Kubernetes, as we discussed previously, Jorge, right? Uh, when I was reading through the documentation, they obscure it, but and it's really just an obfuscation because it ends up as a base 64 encoded string. I'm mm-hmm. like, well, that's not really all that great for protecting your secrets, right? So I'm assuming Sysdig lets me, it gives me some visibility uh-huh. into my secrets management, right? Exactly. So um, by default, Kubernetes stores uh, any resource in its own database called ETCD. And that's base 64 encoded. It's not really encrypted. Um, when using any cloud vendor, uh, Azure, Google, AWS, mm-hmm. these uh, have their own, uh, we call these vaults, where you store your secrets. Mm-hmm. But actually, being hacked into your ETCD, it's not the most common use case for secret leaking. The most mm. common use case for secret leaking is that the developers embed those secrets 
uh, inside the container images. Yep. So as an environment, usually as an environment variable, right? In my environment, or even just copying the file. Yep. I remember that one of the most famous hacks uh, that IBM had in their container infrastructure, it was that a developer copied one of the private keys into the container image. Then they uploaded the container image into a registry, and anyone can, could just download yep. the image with a private key inside. So it's very important, as you can see here, being able to have policies that either scan your containers from the registries or that you can hook into your CIC pipeline and analyze that there are no secrets being leaked, being embedded inside these container images. That's awesome. Uh, more questions for Jorge? Um, I'm on, ooh, I'm ooh, on fire. Go I got one. Go ahead, Jeff. All right. More of a statement. I, I don't know how much you uh, play on this, but I was looking at the Sysdig uh, website as you were talking and uh, was very excited to see how much attention Sysdig is, is spending, uh, how much attention Sysdig, Sysdig is spending on PCI. Mm -hmm. That's we, correct. So, oh, I see. I thought you were going in a completely different direction than that, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> Why would you think that, Paul? <laughs> Here, I'll drink. <laughs> yeah. So that's one of the challenges we are seeing with, uh, especially bigger organizations. Um, containers, Kubernetes, typically starts as an small experiment, maybe by some developers or a small DevOps group. People mm -hmm. like it. They start deploying um, more and more applications, and suddenly the audit and compliance teams, they realize, oh, this group of people, they are running a ton of a lot of workloads and applications on this new infrastructure that we haven't figured it out how to do regulatory compliance on. So uh, the interesting thing is that doing compliance, it's not one uh, one step uh, to in order to implement compliance properly in containers and Kubernetes, it needs to be like an ongoing process implemented across the entire lifecycle. And kind of like, like security, imagine. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly. When like we security. when we explain security, we like to say that we have three phases: the build as you build the containers, as you run the containers, and then as you respond to any security incident. So as you build the containers, you need to be able to mop 13 policies into a specific PCI compliance points. As you go into runtime security, you need to be able to say, hey, does any container or is any of the containers running on my system a privileged container? So you can um, you can look at that. So let me show you this one of the roles that they can detect if any privileged container is running. And then last but not least, PCI requires doing auditing. And we just saw that how we can audit every single access into any um, application. So it's very it's going to be very important to say no, PCI is just a report that I'm just going to execute and I'll get that. It, it needs to be implemented as an ongoing process through the different stages of your container lifecycle. Cool. Yeah, I, I, was, I was very impressed by uh, the website because you know, it says, and I assume that this is embraced by everyone at Sysdig, but you, you, basically it says you decided to join PCI rather than try to beat them, you know, work with them and try to figure out how to do container security. And I, that's commendable because uh, I've had a lot of conversations with folks this past year about PCI and container security and the uh, the bottom line I get is you you can meet all the PCI requirements with containers. You just it's just done differently than the way you used to think about it in a traditional type of network application setting. Mm -hmm. And again, it's the same reason. You have a new infrastructure layer. Uh, there is this disconnection between systems, containers, and users or services. So you need tools 
that they can join the dots between both sides of your infrastructure now. What are, what are some of the security kind of considerations when you're talking about um, kind of how you're setting these particular things up? If, if SysDig is accessed, if an attacker goes after something outside of the container, say they're coming from maybe compromised hosts in the network or they're using you know, a misconfigured Kubernetes cluster and escaping that to get to SysDig, what are the security kind of considerations that people need to be aware of? Obviously, you can look at a lot of logs, you can have a lot of visibility into alerts, you can recreate uh, different processes and stacks and containers. So there's obviously some control stuff you have to put around that, right? Mm -hmm. That's correct. So I think the number one consideration is to make sure your application, your platform, sorry, it's deployed properly. And for that, uh, CIS benchmarks are the way to go. They are a set of checks that you can run your platform against, and you can see if things are configured properly or not. So it helps you to do that, and actually provides like remediation uh, steps if something is uh, misconfigured. So that's why. And, or in, in Tyler, a lot of that misconfiguration, from what I've observed, is there are services uh, in Docker or Kubernetes that are accidentally exposed, maybe mm -hmm. without authentication, where someone can deploy their own container um, or change or modify a configuration, right? And like the more yeah. pieces you have in, in this puzzle, the more you have to be concerned about what, what's exposed where, right? And I'm mm -hmm. assuming yep. SysDig and similar technologies help you get kind of get a handle around that as you've got so many services now that, that you're deploying. That's correct. Again, with these new orchestration layer, you need to make sure like the permissions, Airbuck, are correct, that um, all the authentication uh, and authentication mechanisms, they are in place. So CIS benchmarks allow to do that. Another of the very interesting capabilities, and this is actually something that we released very recently, it's being able to leverage pod security policies. Pod security policies are a very interesting mechanisms inside uh, Kubernetes that allow you to define what are the least privileged uh, uh, access that a pod, a container can have. So basically you use like this jamo like to define what a container can or cannot access. And Sysdig allows you to, to do or to build that process where you can say, oh, I'm going to upload this jamo file that define my application. And since they automatically, it's going to generate the most restrictive uh, pod security policy, the most restrictive least privilege to run that application. And will help you to validate that the policy doesn't break your, your workload, your app. Yeah, Tyler, the uh, attack surface is mm -hmm. Reducing awesome, the right? <laughs> well, it's awesome from, <laughs> if you think about it from an attacker's perspective, right? Any piece that I could gain a hold of in the orchestrator, right? Or something like a Jenkins in the CICD pipeline, like Jenkins today, we're just going through, like you, if you gain access to that, like here are the commands that I run when I deploy my app in production. And oh, by the way, run this other command in this bash script to insert some code into every running container, right? Mm -hmm. And all of mm -hmm. those opportunities are possible. And, and Jorge, I think what you're saying is you provide some controls around that to yeah. provide proper authentication. Yeah, and let me show you something. Yeah, exactly. just, just this afternoon, I was working with my team publishing this, work, this blog post. Uh, last week, there was a huge uh, hype on the internet on these two Python libraries that they mm -hmm. were containing uh, malicious code, uh, the Jellyfish and the Python 3 data util. So uh, we just wrote this blog post uh, with the team where we are basically looking at all the different steps uh, on how you can detect this malicious activity. Number one step is hooking into your CAC pipeline and seeing in if any container is trying to pull in these libraries. But then at runtime, it's very important to see, for example, if any container is connecting to the IP address 
that was like the the central uh, control panel for that malware, or if any developer is using PIP to try to install those libraries. And last but not least, like being able just to, to query with or to detect which uh, applications are trying to steal your GPT keys or SSH keys. So this is very interesting example on how to take an, a specific threat that it was in this case, this malicious Python libraries and how to uh, detect and block through the three uh, phases we mentioned before, build and run and then respond to these incidents. Well, also in, in that case, when I, I think about this particular attack, Jorge, is that if I if I know my application, right, and how it's configured, I, I should be able to define, like, these services need to reach out to the internet, and mm -hmm. these services, they're internal service, they should never reach out to the internet, right? I mean, there's a lot of services within your application that build functionality and don't need to connect back out to the internet. So it's like egress filtering, kind of like, a, not on steroids, but like a different way to think about egress filtering that can also help with this particular problem of malicious libraries being injected into your CI CD pipeline. That's very important. That's correct. And actually, uh, visibility is one of the challenges of, of doing um, security in containers. And one of my favorite ways to visualize this is leveraging our topology maps. And let me see if I can show you that real quick. Oh, with you microservices, that. yeah, that'd be awesome. You have so many parts right. talking to each other. So it's very important to say, being able to say, all right, so I have this example in this Java application, and I have my, my ingress, my clients coming here into my middleware, my Java application, and these are talking into these uh, three different databases. So being able to inspect that traffic mm. to see if these connections make sense or not, it's very important or That's just awesome. going in and see. So show me like all the connections table for that entire application. So I can see all the endpoints, IP addresses and processes. So I can see if everything makes sense or not. And that's oh, a right. fundamental part of security monitoring. That's awesome. And, and so, yeah, there is a monitoring component where I can basically define rules and say, well, if something's trying to do this, alert me, because that's abnormal, right? Mm -hmm. And this is what we call secure DevOps. It's very important, like with containers, with Kubernetes especially, we see that the functions uh, between DevOps and, and security it's not in a straight line anymore. A straight line anymore. Mm. Uh, we see how so the DevOps teams they just start to take some security functions. We see how security teams they need to understand microservices, Kubernetes, and they need to have this specific incident response and all the tools that the are Kubernetes ready. So this is a very interesting challenge uh, nowadays. Like how to do this, what we call DevS uh, DevSecOps or secure DevOps. It's awesome. More questions for Jorge? Negative. Well, oh, I just was, I had a comment and I was, when you're looking at the map of all the connections and, and interdependencies, I don't mm -hmm. know how many conversations I've had about legacy apps where they have no idea what's talking to what and what the interdependency are. And I'm thinking, oh, that conversation goes out the window, we can show you. That's pretty mm -hmm. cool. Yeah, so imagine like imagine someone on your SOC team. They they see that they, there is a, a, a security incident on this application and they have never seen the application before. How they can in in 15 seconds understand how this microservices application is, is architecture. How they can see which component it's talking to each other. So if we are able to give them these diagrams that you are computed dynamically, suddenly they understand, oh, so imagine this service, this resolved microservice actually has this load balancer and I have three instances 
of the service. And I can see how the traffic goes in between. So these examples really, really help people to understand microservices, containers, Kubernetes, and how to operate those in production. It also supports the argument when somebody's saying, my app only does these things, so they can prove it. Or we can say, no, they're not. And as part mm -hmm. of a, a security assessment, you're trying to say that they're, make sure they're doing what they're doing, what they say they're doing, as well as it's secure, mm -hmm. and they're still operational. So this, this that'd be a big help. Well, that's, uh, yeah. that's a very good point. We see one of the, the stories behind this secure DevOps is that DevOps people, when they start troubleshooting an issue, they don't know if it's a, if it's a misconfiguration, if it's a performance issue, or if it's a security incident. And they discover that, they learn that as they go through the incident response and troubleshooting or forensics process. Well, so, so it's, it's a you know it's a great uh, just interject a point there. Uh, it's a great exercise if you're going through the pain of taking a legacy application right and putting in containers and then orchestrating it with Kubernetes as an example. It, the more times you iterate over that configuration and deployment, the deeper understanding you're getting of every component of your app. So in mm -hmm. this container. I know now I only need these Linux packages. I only need these libraries. And then as I further break it apart into more microservices, I, it's mm -hmm. just more well-defined. And then I start defining the connections. Well, these microservices only need access to this storage as, uh, asset. And these need these types of connections. And at, at the more times you iterate, the better you get at saying, this is how my application looks mm -hmm. and should be at all times, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's very important to be able to mix uh, uh, your security information with the runtime context that come in, that comes from Kubernetes. So imagine I want to say, I want to see the vulnerabilities available on this application. And I want to see vulnerabilities that they are like, let's say medium with a uh, fix available. So being able to query or to build these re these reports, it's going to be very important. So, all right, I'm just doing this on the <coughs> on the fly. No, well, that's no good. You have, you have no medium vulnerabilities. That's good. That's yeah. Good start. All right. <laughs> this is safe. <laughs> I'm ready. I'm ready here. But uh, you get the idea. Being able to correlate again to join the dots between information. I don't care if it's like runtime on the system or if it's like just vulnerabilities from the images and to correlate that with um, with um, with the context coming from from Kubernetes. So, hey, Jorge, where can we find out more kind of information around maybe some of the intricacies of, of Sysdig and uh, mm -hmm. how it operates, some of the security things? Do you guys have like a blog, some, some uh, training resources? Yeah, so if you go to our blog, um, we we publish there very often, and we really like to talk about Kubernetes security, about compliance, PCI as well included, uh, also about open source. Um, so that's a great resource of information. We also do talks and webinars, so definitely check those out as well. Um, and I would say that that's... That's probably the first uh, to um, starting point to learn more about this day. That's Resources fantastic. Resources page and the blog. And there's uh, uh, Falco is the open source component. And obviously, we saw a demo of the, the commercial product. And if mm -hmm. our listeners want to learn more, you can go to securityweekly.com forward slash Sysdig. Find all of the resources uh, and segments that Sysdig has done with us. Jorge, thank you so much for appearing on Paul Security Weekly. It's been a pleasure, like always. I really enjoy having some time with you guys. Absolutely. Thank you so much. With that, we'll take a short break. Come back with none other, the man, the myth, the legend, Mr. John Strand. Okay.